All right, it is my great pleasure to be the one introducing you to electromagnetic waves. This is one of the most exciting parts of, uh, of introductory physics because you get to see one of the greatest triumphs of, well, I would say classical physics, but it, it is classical physics, but it also gives you the prelude to modern physics because this is where there were starting to be some hints that thing, that our models, our classical models, were not complete. As in, when you took it in a step further, you started to see that you couldn't have both the beautiful, elegant equations and have classical physics hold up. All right, so these are Maxwell's equations. Um, and what I've done here is write them in two different ways, where these are the integral forms, and these are the differential forms. So, some of these are rather familiar, and we're going to walk through them uh, for each of the different laws. You've actually used Gauss's laws both for electromagnetism and, or elect, uh, electricity and for magnetism, and um, you have you, you've already used Ampere's law, and we'll just extend this to basically the it's fair, called Faraday's law, but it's Ampere's law for um, electromagnetic collisions. So what you see is a lot of symmetry between the equations for electric fields and magnetic fields. And I I'm going to come back to this slide after we've reviewed each of the laws individually. Okay. So we have Gauss's law for electricity. And what this says is that if you take an integral over a closed surface, so this has got to be closed in three dimensions, but my board here is only in two dimensions. So I've got some different charges sitting around inside of a closed three-dimensional surface. If I take the, the surface so this means integrating over a closed surface, which means that it is a two-dimensional, it is a two-dimensional integral. Um, the electric field, the dot product of the electric field, with the area vector, where the area uh, vector is a small segment of area. Um, so this would be, for instance. In Cartesian coordinates, this would be dx, dy, and then you have some unit vector which is perpendicular to the surface. Um, so you take the dot product of that. So you're looking at how at the component of the electric field perpendicular to the surface times the, a small segment of the area of the surface. You integrate over that closed surface. This is equal to the sum of the enclosed of the charges enclosed in that surface divided by epsilon naught. This is the version of Gauss's law that we have already seen in this. Uh, we've seen that already this semester. The differential version of Gauss's law is the Del operator. Now. Many of you guys are concurrently in Calculus 2, if you are taking this in a semi-standard US curriculum. Um, if you, in a perfect world, you would learn all of the math first, and then we teach you the physics, except that if you do that, you don't know why you're learning the math, and you probably would have forgotten it. So we sort of teach it to you at the same time. Uh, at any rate, this is one of those sections where I'm going to say, if you're not comfortable with the math, Feel free to jump ahead until I move to the next slide. So this operator, all right, so um, we use this, we call this the Dell operator in, uh, now, so I'm going to introduce some math concepts to you. 
okay if you don't totally get them at this point. So the del operator, that one's a little tired. The del operator is in Cartesian coordinates, a partial derivative with respect to x times the vector x. A partial derivative means you only take the derivative as a the derivative as a function of x, even if there's other variables in there. So you ignore everything except x. And you have similar terms for y and z. For the moment, I will spare you the non-Cartesian co coordinate forms, but let me warn you that they are very different. If you are working in uh, spherical polar coordinates or polar coordinates, you cannot use this form of del. So what del says is, or sorry, what the, the Gauss's law, for, differential Gauss's law um, version says del dot the electric field. So if I write my electric field as E x x hat plus E y y hat plus E z z hat, this is my electric field. And then when I take del dot E hat, so this operator means that I use, I am doing, an operator is something that does something. You actually have already used operators even if you did not think of them that way. So here, an integral, this integral sign, it is an operator. It says, take the integral of this. Um, and when you write something like partial, like dy dx, dy dx, is the derivative of y with respect to x. When you write it like that, that is what happens when you take the derivative operator and act, uh, that should be an x, and you act with d, your operator is d dx, and you act with this operator on the function y. Now, that if you're just doing simple operations, it doesn't make sense to define the concept of an operator, but we will talk about what happens when you get different combinations of operators and you do things in different ways. So now, del dot e, I have this dot product with, the dot product of that with this. The unit vector is constant, in Cartesian coordinates, it is not constant in spherical polar or polar coordinates. So when I take the dot product, I am taking this times the x component times the x component, I get partial partial x of ex plus this, this the y component times y. So now the derivative partial partial y is acting on EY. And then partial partial Z is acting on EZ. All right. So what Gauss's differ the differential version says is that del dot e, which is this mess, is equal to the density of charges where this is density is something like the total charge divided by the volume, except that can now be a spatial depend dependence because the charges do not have to be uniformly distributed. Um, and then divided by epsilon naught. So if you look at this side, this side has units of the uh, units of the electric field, SI units or volts per meter, um, then times the area, so volts per meter times meters squared or voltmeters. This 
This has units of volts per meter. Div or, sorry, this side has uh, this side has this should also work to, out to be volt meters. Um, but then comparing this side, this ha has electric field units divided by meters cubed, whereas this this is charge. This is charge per uh, sorry. This is electric field divided by uh, meters. This let's just put this. So this is volt meters times meters squared. This is or sorry, volts per meter divided by meters. So whereas this one works out to be volt meters, this one works out to be volts per meter squared. This, we have charge. Here we have charge per meter squared. So this, the units on this are equal, or the units are equal to the units on this times meters cubed. So this is just Look, this is looking at charge density. This is looking at total charge. Now, you've already used Gauss's law. Gauss's law is your old friend because you were using it to calculate charge densities earlier in the semester. Gauss's law for magnetism has the same shape. So I'm going to toggle back and forth. Here, we had electric field dotted with the area equals Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Here, magnetic field dotted with the area equals zero. Why is that? There are no, uh, there are no magnetic monopoles. We do not have sources, point sources of magnetic fields where the field does not wrap around it and come back. So there is, there are no magnetic source sources like there are point charges. So that source, if you look at the analogous equation the sources of magnetic fields have to go to zero. And so that's where you get Gauss's law for magnetism. And then here on the differential side, there are, there are no point sources. So there is no density of point sources for the magnetic fields. So over here, this one goes to zero too. And then you can do all of the fun, the thing, the fun that we had with Gauss's law for the electric field. You can do exactly the same thing with Gauss's law for magnetic fields. You can have fun with Gauss's law until the cows come home. It's a really cool law. It's one of my favorites. OK, how do you pick favorite laws of physics? All right, then we have Ampere's law. And we did a bunch of exercises with Ampere's law where we were, you can, you can figure out the number of, the, the total um, number of current sources the same way that you could with Gauss's law, except now you're integrating over, um, you're, you're still integrating over surfaces. You have slightly different surfaces. So now um, here, I'm going to still have a uh, closed surface. Nope, this has a typo. I will fix the online slides, and this should be... I checked these, but I, I was fast in my, we're going to, I was fast in typing up my slides. This is V dot DL, and this has to be over a closed line, not a surface. So that S should be an L, or the, a DL. So now when we enclose um, we have a some type of line integral. We're looking at the currents enclosed in the loop. So here we have, if, if we do the, so that's what this means physically. You do the line integral in a closed loop. And whatever currents you enclose, your line integral is mu naught i. And then we have to have a correction. So when we worked with Ampere's law before, we were working with constant currents, and we did not have to worry about changing electric and magnetic fluxes. Well, what we have learned since, a changing magnetic field induces an electric field. 
And the opposite is true as well. A changing electric field induces a changing magnetic field. So, whereas before we only had to concern ourselves with, um, with physical currents, now we have to consider the apparent current which is created by these changing electric fields. This is called the displacement current. So now the, uh, the line integral B dot DL is equal to mu naught times the current plus the displacement current. And then we have the differential form, which says that this del cross B, I will explain del cross B in just a minute, is equal to mu naught times the current density. Um, so that is current per unit area. And then this 1 over C squared partial derivative of the electric field with respect to time. This 1 over C squared, why does the speed of light, so that C is the speed of light, why does that come in? Well, we will get to that when we talk about electromagnetic waves, um, because it's really I will wait, I will save the punchline until we get to that. Okay, so then this speed of light squared happens to be one over epsilon naught mu naught. Um, so this is relating these two fundamental physical constants to each other into the speed of light. Ooh, that's tantalizing. It's telling us that there's some really cool stuff going on. All right. So then, um, uh, and that flux, we've, we've talked about the magnetic flux, this is, and this is the electric flux, this is the, uh, now we're talking about the surface integral over some surface, and you're looking at how much the, um, how much the electric flux through some surface changes. So these, um, just as we saw with Gauss's law and the differential and integral forms, they're very closely related, um, with ever so slightly different, um, slightly different forms. What is this term here? This is the point where I say, if you're struggling a bit with the math, not that comfortable yet, pause this, come back to this before you take up upper level electricity and magnetism. So remember that our del operator is x hat in Cartesian coordinates. I just want to put a pin in this for you so that when you get to higher level classes, you don't get confused, but del is not a constant in spherical polar and polar coordinates. And these unit vectors, they are also not constant when you move into different coordinate systems. But we're sticking with coordinate systems because electricity and magnetism is hard enough for a 100 level class without us getting into uh, non-Cartesian coordinate systems. All right, so this is our del operator. And we are going to write our magnetic field as Vx x hat plus, sometimes the two markers just get tired. I think I'm exercising them too much. Vy y hat, oh, that's a beautiful one. This one's not tired at all. It's the same color, but you almost couldn't tell. Vy y hat plus Vz z hat. And now you may not be super confident with cross products. I encourage you to get comfortable with cross products. If you're taking this class, you are probably in a technical field and you are going to have to get used to cross products, whether you like it or not. So you might as well learn how to love it. All right, so our cross product we have to take, so we're going to do unit vector, first component of the first vector. In this case, our components are this operator, and then first component of the second vector. And my second row looks exactly the same, but or my second column, except I've got changed all my x's to 
y's, and in my third row, the variable is z. Now, a thing about operators is that they are not commutative. It matters which order you take them in. So, some of the tricks that I maybe sort of slipped in in one of the earlier lectures about how you can take the determinant in different ways until you're super comfortable with operators. Do not try this at home. Um, we're going to just use the rote rule that you guys learned when you learned cross product. So now we are going to take the determinants of each of the sub parts. So we're going to do first row, first column times the determinant of this sub matrix right here. Partial, partial y, b, y, partial, partial z, b, z. And then I'm going to wrap around to the next column because I don't have enough room to make it fit on one row. Then we are going to do y hat. Now I'm going to do the sub matrix with this and this. Partial, partial x, b, x. Even if you've never had matrices, it is, and you're just learning this algorithmically, I am still going to call them matrices. I encourage you, if you are a physics major, take that matrix algebra class. It will help you, whether or not you are required to. Next one, we are going to take z hat times this sub matrix. And remember, every time you switch a row or a column, you change your sign. So we have plus, minus, plus. If this is not seared onto your brain yet, spend the time to sear it onto your brain because you will need to use it over and over and over again. All right, now we are going to act, so order matters. So it is this times this. Your derivative operator is always acting first. Once a derivative operator acts on something, it's used up. You don't use it again. So if you, we have, so partial partial y times bz, that operator is, is used up. It doesn't take the derivative of anything else. So now we have x hat partial partial y of bz minus partial partial z of by plus y hat partial, partial x of bz minus partial, partial z of b yeah, x. Just double checking. All right. Ah, and I needed to change sign here. Keep my negative sign. Minus or sorry, now we're on a plus z hat, partial, partial, x, b, z, minus, partial, partial, z, b, x. All right. I am going to put, I'm going to multiply through by this negative sign, and then I'm going to show you a trick. When I do that, I have to switch the x's and z's here. I'm going to show you a trick to double check your work. Because when you work with cross products and all of that, this gets really, really confusing. So the odds that you will, even if you know what you're doing, the odds that you will make a small mistake are somewhat high. So now, my first row is my unit vector, my second row is my derivative, and my third row is my magnetic field. 
here, I go x, y, z. x, y, z. This is positive. Now, I'm going y, z, x. This is positive. So I can do x, y, z, or I can rotate that and go z, x, y, or I can rotate that and go y, z, x. These are all positive if I am going in alphabetical order. x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. x, z, y is negative. y, x, z is negative. z, this has, these z's should be y's. I have, see, this is where, if even I am doing it, you, my friend, are also going to make stupid mistakes. The difference between me and you is not how many stupid mistakes we make. The difference is how quickly we catch them. I catch them faster. Um, and I'm more likely to catch them before I'm done because I'm using these tricks where I'm checking that my answer makes sense. Okay, so I should always have an X, a Y, and a Z in every single term. I knew I had something wrong because I didn't. So now I have Z, Y, X. All right, so these are all of the terms that are in the opposite direction of the alphabet. It should be an X. X, Y, Z going backwards. So Z, Y, X. This is opposite. Z, Y, X. Z, Y, X. If I'm going opposite the alphabetical direction, then I have a negative sign. So anyhow, this is the big, long, ugly term for the curl. If you have not had ca vector calculus, you have not yet seen the curl. It is a derivative operator. It is an ugly derivative operator. It is a manageable derivative operator. Um, but it does tend to make calculations in electricity and magnetism complicated. And so, the, the, but the point is that if you know the magnetic field, you can figure out the current sources. Um, and because the uh, changing electric field can lead to a magnetic field, if you have any um, changing electric fields, that also influences the magnetic field. And that is Ampere's law. And finally, we come to Faraday's law, where I have the same mistake in this that I had before. This should be a line integral. Uh, actually, no, this one is not a line integral. Um, this one is, and, but this side, yeah. So this is Faraday's law. You now have a surface integral over an electric field, and this has to equal the changing magnetic flux, and then the curl of the electric field is related to the time derivative of the magnetic field. So toggling, now we're going to go back to this, and I am going to correct my typo. This is, uh, we'll just squiggle this out. This is a DL, and this is a line integral. Um, all right, so then you can see a lot of symmetry in these equations. So um, when you have the, um, so you have Gauss's law for electric and magnetic fields. 
The differences is, are that there are no point sources of magnetic fields. And then you have Ampere's law and Faraday's law. And you have similar, so here, the, because there are no point sources there uh, for magnetic fields, you don't have a term over here with a current source for magnetic fields because there's no point, uh, there's no magnetic monopoles. These Maxwell's equations, they are one of the triumphs of classical physics. All right, so then we go to electromagnetic waves. And um, I am going to start with the differential forms of, um, of Maxwell's equations. And these are the ones without the typos. Thank heavens. So we're going to ask the question, let's say you are in free space. There are no point charges. Can there be an electric field and a magnetic field? Well, a changing electric field leads to a changing magnetic field. So if you happen to have an electric field already, can you have a magnetic field? Is there a non-zero solution to this problem? I am going to pick a well-motivated trial solution. I will leave discussions of the general solution for when you guys would take upper division classical uh, upper division electromagnetism. That is not a, an undergraduate level question. All right, so I'm going to pick this well-motivated trial solution. Um, what this says is that the derivative of either of the fields in the direction of the field has to be zero. So the derivative of the x component of the electric field with respect to x has to be zero. It isn't changing. So partial, let me write that out. Partial e sub x, partial x. Well, at least the sum of them has to be zero. Um, but if we want to have a nice, neat solution, it sure is a lot easier um, if they're all equal to zero. So that's what these equations say. So I'm just going to pick the simplest solution. I guess this is not generically true, but we're going to look at those very specific cases. And so I am going to pick an electric field, which is in the y direction, but which um, varies in the x direction. So as I, this is varying sinusoidally, so if, Let's see, this is my y direction, and that is the electric field is there, and then in the x direction, my electric field is changing sinusoidally. And then, do we, is there a solution for the magnetic field? And remember, we have no point charges. There is no clear source for these waves. They are out there in free space. Okay, so is there a solution? Well, now we have an electric field. Let's look at whether we can find a solution for the magnetic field using this. So once I have this solution, I can look at the time derivative of this field. And uh, let's see, we'll start with this side. So here, I'm going to look up that curl. Remember that big mess that we did last time on the previous slide? So that's saying partial y, partial z um, has to, so this is a, um, that, to get this to be, uh, this is missing a vector sign. So because, as is this one, because I need my, I need each component to match on this side. So this side of the equa equation in the x direction, this is the x component. And then this one is the z component of this. And this is the y component. So these give me 
some interesting relationships between x and uh, between the derivatives of b with respect to of the magnetic field with respect to different coordinates now what this can tell me is for instance here if i choose if i am able to if i choose bz not equal to not have any dependence on y and by to not have any dependence on z i'm okay that's a solution to this i can do the same thing bx does not have any dependence on y and by does not have any dependence on x i'm okay all right, now here, they're weirdly coupled. Now let's look at what this side does. So when I take the time derivative, I pull out a factor of omega and my cosine changes into a sine. So now I can choose a few different solutions. But I'm going to look at, let's assume that bx is 0. And if I choose bx is 0, then partial bz, negative partial bz, bx has to equal, or d, dx has to equal this mass. So I'm saying, let me cross this term out. I'm selecting this to be 0. And now I'm looking for something where the derivative of b with respect to x is this mass. But I know how to integrate this. So if I integrate it, then um, I get cosine kx minus omega t. And then the derivative of cosine is the negative sine. So I get my negative sign. So that cancels this negative sign. And then I get, uh, I am integrating, I, I am going to, I have to, I have to divide by k, so my slides have another typo. I should have a k on the bottom. All right, so now I have e naught omega over k, c divided by c squared. Now let's look at that omega over k term. What we know for all waves is that the speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. And I can write this as 2 pi over or wavelength over 2 pi times 2 pi times the frequency. Well, this is omega, and this is 1 over the wave number. So the speed is equal to omega over the wave number. And for the speed, we're going to, we're asking, well, so. We're talking about light, so the speed is omega over k. So, in fact, well, what this, the fact that there is a solution with some funky constants tells you that there is, in fact, a solution. That solution is electromagnetic waves. And so if you choose this to be a light wave, then the magnetic the field has the solution E naught over C cosine kx minus omega t. So that means if we, and this was the z component, so if you have, so let's see, ah, I don't want to do the handed system because you guys see the mirror image. If you have an electric field which is entirely in the y direction, you, in the positive direction, you will get a, um, one of these solutions is uh, um, to have, a magnetic field which is in the z direction. Now, I had made a choice over here where I could have chosen to have so an electric field in the x direction. Now here because there's a derivative there's no fun dependence on z here in in this function, so I wouldn't have gotten I wouldn't have an interesting solution for z. 
Of course, this was totally arbitrary. So if I have um, an electric field in the y direction, I have a magnetic field in the z direction. There is a solution to Maxwell's equations for an electric field and a magnetic field that change in time in the absence of any point sources so that you have varying electric and magnetic fields. No point sources, you still have electromagnetic waves. Maxwell said, let there be light, and there was light. Sorry, I had to. Um, so then what you get, so electromagnetic waves, you have varying electric field, a changing electric field induces a magnetic field, that changing magnetic field induces an electric field. And as it goes on, so as you go across in space, they're changing together. And they're changing as a, so this shows you a snapshot of the electric field as a function of time. So if I stand in one, I was doing it as if it were propagating. There's actually, so this is called a plane, that solution is a plane wave, meaning that the solution says that it exists in all space. It's like a plane. Um, there's, there's a plane that has electric fields everywhere. All right, so if I stand in one spot, my changing electric field induces, oh, let's see. Sorry. Whoop, 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 whoop. There, so there's oscillating electric and magnetic fields in space as a function of time. And this is the plane wave solution to Maxwell's equations. Now, there were a lot of arbitrary sources, so, uh, choices. If you look at that, you can choose, you can find multiple different solutions that are not a plane wave. But we often work with the plane wave solution. Why do we often work with the plane wave solution? Well, it's a lot easier to work with than some of the more complicated solutions. And um, we can get most of the same physics out of it. Also, math interlude, through the wonder of something called um, Fourier series. A Fourier series is when you take some arbitrary function. So I have some random function. We'll say it's of x. And it turns out that well, I can describe it as a sum of signs. Ah, oh, I need a. I can describe it as a sum of signs and cosines. That is a Fourier series. So I can take some any arbitrary function, math caveats, it must be reasonably smooth and differentiable, and I can describe it as a sum of sines and cosines. Now, our plane wave solution, we chose to describe with a, with a cosine. You could choose to describe it as a sine, but you can basically then, the fact that you can use Fourier series means that you can describe anything any arbitrary function as a sum of different, any arbitrary uh, solution of Maxwell's equations as a sum of plane waves. That's not always the best way to describe it, but it will always work. Sometimes in physics, we choose elegant solutions, but often in when you have to work out solutions in the real world, sometimes you use brute force because brute force will usually work eventually. Fourier series let you do things with brute force that you cannot do elegant, elegantly. Sometimes they're also elegant. All right, then we can move to oscillating fields. How do you get these plane waves? All right, so here is how an, an antenna works. If you have an alternating current traveling through your wire, that alternating current, it really is telling you, so you've got your voltage applied to this circuit, that alternating current is telling you the direction of a changing electromagnetic field, uh, sorry, a changing electric field. When you change that electric field, 
you are inducing a magnetic field. Remember, I've got to use my left hand. I've got to use my, this is my left hand is my stage right hand because you guys see it as my right hand. So remember my right hand rule when I'm using, uh, when I'm talking about currents, I stick my thumb up in the direction of the, um, of the current and I wrap my fingers around and that gives me the direction of the magnetic field. So I have this changing electric field that leads to a changing magnetic field and the changing magnetic field from the alternating current in the wire leads to a changing electric field and so on and so on and so on. So if you have an alternating current traveling through a wire, you are actually inducing electromagnetic radiation. This has been the subject of many conspiracy theories. Those people who talk about uh, how the transformers in your backyard, they're gonna, and how cell phones, that's all gonna lead to cancer. That is from this idea. Now, thinking about it and asking the question itself is not crazy. That is a valid question for inquiry. We have actually looked extensively as to at whether or not the changing electric fields and changing magnetic fields caused by transformers, um, even whether it's the transformers in your backyard or the transformers along power lines, none of that actually causes cancer. We have extensive epidemiological data from the, the fact that many people are around them. We would see way, way, way more cancer in the world if those things caused cancer. It has been thoroughly debunked. Asking the question, okay. But the answer to that question is no, it doesn't cause cancer. Um, at least not in any significant level. Now, I couldn't tell you if it causes an extra one case of cancer in 30 million people, we probably would not be able to detect it. But you can say that about a lot of things. No, electric power lines don't cause cancer. Cell phones don't cause cancer. Okay, so this is... So every power line you have, because most of the things that we use in the world, they use alternating current. So almost everything would be, throwing, would be generating a bunch of electromagnetic waves. All right, here you can see a schematic of the apparatus that Hertz used in 1887 to generate and detect electromagnetic waves. So he had... It's an RLC circuit, just like from last, last chapter. He had an RLC circuit, a transformer. This induces a voltage in, the, in this circuit. That means that there is a changing potential here. And when the potential, so this is a spark gap, when the potential reaches, a, when the potential gets large enough, so we have assumed thus far that air is a perfect insulator. But if you get a large enough uh, voltage across, well, even if it's a vacuum, if you get a large enough voltage across some gap, the electrons are gonna jump anyways. And that is called a spark. So you can induce sparks here, and those sparks will actually induce, those sparks, the, uh, electrons, because we know the charge carriers are electrons, jumping from one side of the loop to the other, that is going to lead to changing electric fields. That, those electric fields do not need a medium to propagate. You will learn about that in the, next, um, in the next volume of the book if you continue on with this book, or you will learn about it when you take modern physics. If you're not taking modern physics, you should learn about it anyways, because it's like the coolest part. Okay, so then you end up with those electric fields traveling over here. The electric field can induce a spark itself, and then you can look for that. Um, and this is how Hertz actually detected electromagnetic waves. Now, at the point that we leave this semester, everybody was befuddled because the speed of light in Maxwell's equations is a constant. It doesn't need a medium. The waves that we talked about in the last um, in the last semester, they needed a medium to travel. If you need a medium, then the speed of light, the speed of the wave is dependent on the medium. So why don't Maxwell's equations depend on the medium? 
they assumed that the th their theory was imperfect and that they were looking at things where approximately the speed of light was constant. Put a pin in it, come back to that. That's where classical physics, one of the places where classical physics starts to fall apart. All right, now in an antenna, what you do is that you have, uh, you can think of it as moving charges. That's the same thing as you are, have some voltage source and you're changing the vol voltage. And you're changing the voltage now, not simply, um, you don't have to change it simply by uh, oscillating it in the sinusoidal wave. You can choose any arbitrary function. And then when you wiggle the charges in an antenna, it sends out electromagnetic waves. Hint, that's how a radio works. That's how a lot of things work. That's also how, okay, that's how TVs used to work. I can't say it's how TVs work anymore. All right, then um, you can talk about the energy carried by a wave. So it's going to depend on the amplitude of the, electromag of the electric field and of the magnetic field. Um, and the, elect the magnitude of the electric field and the magnetic field are inextricably connected. Because if you remember when we did that solution for an electromagnetic wave, as soon as you had the electric field, it told you what the magnitude of the magne magnetic field was. Um, and it will be left to, well, you can look at the derivation in the book as well, the energy density, meaning the energy per unit volume of the electric field is epsilon naught e squared, which you can rearrange because the amplitude of the magnetic and electric fields are related to V squared over mu naught. All right, and then we can talk about the motion of energy, and we quantify the motion of energy by something called the pointing, the, the, the pointing vector, and, and this is not with an I, it's, af, it's named after pointing a man, P-O-Y-N-T-I-N-G, um, and the pointing vector is the 1 over mu naught E cross B. So now, your electric fields and your magnetic fields, they're oscillating together. And I have to remember to use my stage right hand. Um, so let's choose electric field here, magnetic field here. Uh, so electric field cross product with the magnetic field is a plane wave which has the electric field in this direction and the magnetic field in that direction, so pick an instant of time, um, then the, um, the energy flow is towards you. Now, that same electric field, remember these guys are moving in tandem, uh, electric field, magnetic field, later, this is the electric field, that's the magnetic field, E cross, let's see, uh, no, sorry, this is the electric field, this is the magnetic field. So I have to do E cross B, and the energy flow is still towards you. So, and we also can, can look later if you have a smaller packet of, of waves instead of the plane wave. So the, the messy part about a plane wave is that it exists over all space, and that's not very realistic. So, but if you have an electromagnetic wave, um, the pointing vector points in the direction of travel of the wave. All right. All right, so in this example, we are given the power of, in, which is in your book, we are given the power of a light bulb. So we are given the power, P, Two are a little soft. The power, um, the intensity, is equal to the power divided. The, the power divided by the um, the intensity is the amount of uh, in, uh, the uh, amount of energy transmitted per unit time per unit area. So we then have to divide by the volume, the surface area of a sphere. So if we are three meters away, 
the energy in the light bulb is spread out over, over a sphere, um, which is three meters in radius. Now, the surface area of a sphere is equal to four pi r squared. Uh, so the power is equal to the the power over four pi r squared is equal to the intensity, and uh, we have some expressions to start with for the intensity, um, which is the electric field. Well, let's use c times the magnitude of the magnetic field divided by. 2 mu naught, and the question asked us for um, the average electric and magnetic fields a certain distance away. Now, this is going to give us the amplitude of the, uh, we can get the amplitude of the electric and the magnetic fields. So first of all, this version, we can take uh, the magnetic field We'll go ahead and solve this guy. Um, and I have, I'm going to just cancel, I'm going to rewrite it because I'm going to reuse this equation. Um, so I have power times mu naught divided by 2 pi r squared c is equal to b naught squared square root. Now, I did that very quickly. I would recommend that you do things very slowly in your homework, write out multiple steps, because the number one problem you are likely to make is stupid mistakes. Number two, I catch them faster. OK, so this will give us the average magnetic field. We now want a similar expression for the electric field. So we are going to use that the magnetic, the amplitude of, oh, we'll come back to the average because it asks for the average. The amplitude of the magnetic field is equal to the amplitude of the electric field over C, and C squared equals 1 over um, epsilon naught mu naught. So we will use both of those expressions. I am going to plug this into there, and I get I equals P over 4 pi R squared. And, ah, actually, okay, yeah, we'll come back to the average because it comes into reading what the problem asked you for. So this is then C over 2 mu naught times E naught over C quantity squared. So one of these C's cancels out. For the other, we are going to plug in that one over C, or let's see, we are going to plug in that mu naught equals I'm going to use mu naught is 1 over epsilon naught c squared. So I'm going to plug that in here, and that gives me an epsilon naught c squared over 2 c E zero squared, these guys cancel out, and I can solve for the electric field as power over 2 pi r squared epsilon naught c square root. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so that gives me the electric field. Now, average versus instantaneous. So this, actually, this would all be true for the instantaneous, um, it, instantaneous power. Now, we were given the average power. What I mean is that this is actually a sine wave, and you're out, you've already averaged over it, so because we were asked for the average, this is going to give you the average as well. Now, we use the fact that in three dimensions, um, as if you have some, if you have a point source and you have something distributed over three dimensions, then it spreads out over the full surface area of something um, uh, of the source so that if you're three meters away, the power is distributed over that, um, over a sphere with the surface area equal to, of a sphere with a radius equal to the distance from the source. We use that over and over and over again. And the fact that that surface area goes like, the, the surface area of a sphere goes like four pi r squared is why you see one over r squared laws for electricity and for gravity, because you take your point source and you're spreading it over a surface area that increases with r squared. Um, and actually, it's um, when you get to the next level of physics, you will learn that you can model each of these forces as they are carried by something called force mediators. Um, for the electromagnetic force, that force mediator is the photon or light. And so you can think about it as different particles being thrown, thrown out from the source. And the number of them is uh, per unit area is equal to one over the area, in this case, the area of the sphere. And that is why most of these, uh, why our physical laws, our, our forces, tend to fall off with one over r squared. All right, so then if you have an electromagnetic wave, that electromagnetic wave, because you have an electric field, you have a magnetic field, they can, in fact, combine and produce a force in the direction of propagation. Um, so for instance, if you have, uh, have electrons, um, you can you smack them with an electric uh, an electromagnetic wave, they will actually move. Um, and this is detectable. So here you can see a simplified diagram of the apparatus that is used to measure radiation pr pressure. So radiation pressure means if you hit something with a lot of electromagnetic waves, you can actually get it to move because you have an energy density. That energy density is moving in a certain direction and that can produce a pressure. That is because the electromagnetic wave, it carries momentum. So when you have something, have, when it hits something, its momentum is in the direction of the pointing vector. So when, it, so you will have, it will have, when that electromagnetic wave hits something, it's a collision, it experiences a, uh, it, it will end up with a net force in the direction of the electromagnetic wave. And the, the way that this was measured is that they shone light on a mirror, on one mirror and not on the other, and you actually can predict that there is a deflection of the mirror. It's e easiest to do like this because if you, for instance, have light here, you can uh, shine, you can reflect the light off of this and you can figure out if it's, um, if it's getting rotated. So you hang the, the connected mirrors from a fiber, and you can see if you actually end up getting rotation. All right, then we can talk about applications of electromagnetic waves. Here you can see one of many different uh, diagrams showing the different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So to me, it's all a photon, um, but the different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum tend to get special names. Radio waves um, can be on the side, on the order of um, you know, on the order of buildings. So here you've got, uh, you can have um, radio waves that are like meters, kilometers, um, 
this is, uh, so they're, they tend to be large. Um, when you have waves, they tend to be blocked by objects on the order of the scale of the waves. So radio waves can get blocked by buildings. Um, then you have microwaves. Microwaves are, so 10 to the negative 2, that is on the order of a centimeter. Microwaves can be blocked by things on the order of a centimeter. Um, infrared waves on the order of 10 to the negative 5th. Infrared really just means um, that it is on the red side compared to uh, compared to light, so it is a longer wavelength than light. Um, visible light is 10 to the negative, around 10 to the negative 6, so this tends to be in, measured in nanometers, although anything less than about 5 times 10 to the negative 6, that's infrared. Um, and then you get ultraviolet, which is beyond what we can see. So our eyes can see to about 700, 750 nanometers. So anything with a wavelength longer than that is, um, is beyond violet light. Um, and then you get x-rays on the order of 10 to the negative 10th and gamma rays 10 to the negative 12th. Um, these are the wavelengths. So um, the, the um, visible light can distinguish things as small as single cells. Ultraviolet light can distinguish molecules. X-rays distinguish atoms. Gamma rays distinguish things on the level of the atomic nucleus. So if you want to break up an atomic nucleus, you tend to use gamma rays. Um, but ultraviolet light can break up molecules. And in fact, and they can interact with and excite molecules. And this is one of the reason ultra, reasons ultraviolet light can create, um, can create cancer. You'll find all sorts of different breakdowns of what these are. This top line, what, per, what per, penetrates the Earth's atmosphere? Now, um, this is dominant, what penetrates the Earth's atmosphere is dominantly driven by uh, the absorption spectrum of water because water is one of the dominant things in, um, in the atmosphere. So uh, there's enough gook that stops stuff that's really high wavelength. Here, you have um, absorption of uh, absorption in, of water, um, but visible light gets through, as do radio waves. So if you go to long enough wavelengths, then basically the atmosphere is too small to block them. OK, then you can use the, these electromagnetic waves in order to transmit signals, as you may well know. Or maybe you're young enough that you haven't really used a real radio. Um, you probably, you guys have often used digital radios, but you can, in fact, transmit it, transmit radio waves where uh, you have. You can either choose to oscillate the amplitude, which is AM radio, or frequency. Amplitude modification, AM radio. Frequency modification, FM radio. The wavelengths for uh, AM radio are on the order, well, the wavelengths for FM radio are on the order of your short little FM radio. Oh, you might not have them. All right, I'm older than you are, most likely. If you're watching this video, I'm probably older than you are. Um, so FM radio waves are, have wavelengths on the order of your FM radio antenna, which is about the size of my arm. AM radio wavelengths tend to be a lot longer. They tend to be a couple meters. Um, and that's why if you have a good radio that also gets AM radio, your AM radio wave antenna is probably a long wire that is better suit that can be longer than your FM radio um, antenna. And that's better suited to capture the, the, um, the oscillations from AM radio. All right. And here you can look at Oh, microwave ovens. You guys have all used a microwave. And the way that microwaves work is that you have microwave radiation that is incident upon, incident upon um, water molecules. And it just so happens that water absorbs in the microwave region. So um, when you have um, microwaves hitting, uh, hitting uh, water, it makes them shake, it makes them vibrate. Um, and that's in that microwave radiation is on the order of, of centimeters. It fits in your microwave. Fun fact, 
your microwave produces standing waves. You guys learned about standing waves last semester. When you have standing waves, that means that there are nodes. So inside of your microwave, there are nodes where you will actually have no amplitude. This is one of the reasons why you can get hot spots in food that you have warmed up with a microwave. It is another reason why if you ever heat up milk for an infant or formula for an infant, you should not use it the microwave because you can get hot spots and cold spots. So you can get very cold milk, but at the same time, there will be regions that can burn the infant's tongue and they can't tell you that something's wrong. So your microwave has cold, cold spots and hot spots because it is using standing microwaves. Um, and there is a very small fraction of the, visible, of the electromagnetic spectrum that has visible components. This is what we know as light. Um, although I admit I think about it as a physicist, they're all electromagnetic waves to me. Um, and there's no hard distinguishing, our, our distinction between each of the different colors. We've sort of drawn arbitrary lines. Um, so well, you've learned that there are all these colors in the rainbow, it's actually just a smeared out spectrum at any wavelength is possible. Goes from about a little bit more than 700 nanometers to about 380 nanometers on the low end. Anything with a shorter wavelength is ultraviolet. Anything with a longer wavelength is infrared. All right, then we can do some examples. In which situation below will the electromagnetic wave be successful in inducing a current in the wire? Okay, if we want to induce a current in the wire, we want something to cause the force carry the charge carriers in that wire to oscillate. So we want to act on it's easier to get that uh, the charge carriers oscillating with an electromagnetic field because it moves it up in it moves it up and down. So we will fi find it easier. In this case, the electric field is aligned with the wire right here. In this case, the electric field is perpendicular to the wire. Here, the electric field is going to cause those charge carriers to oscillate in the wire. So A is easier. It makes it easier to, um, to induce a current in the wire. In which situation shown below will the electromagnetic wave be more successful in inducing a current in the loop? The same, um, same reasoning, except now we want to look at changing the magnetic flux in the loop. So um, in A, the magnetic flux is changing more in the loop of the current than in B, because here B, it, the loop is here, and B is in the same direction, is, is in the same plane as the loop of the, the, the loop of wire. So in this case, because you're changing the magnetic flux in the loop more, the, the answer is A. All right, shown below is the interference pattern of two radio wave antennas broadcasting the same signal. Explain how this is analogous to the interference pattern for sound produced by two speakers. Well, either way, the math is the same. You have a wave that you can model as a point source, and at least you can start out as modeling it as a sinusoidal source. When you have two, uh, two sources of waves, they can interfere constructively and destructively, and that means that you can end up functionally, so could this be used to make a directional antenna system? Yes, it can. You can actually get, you, you can tune your source so that you end up getting um, a larger amp, you can end up getting constructive interference in one direction and destructive interference in the other so that you can more successfully broadcast in a certain direction. All right, and then suppose the parallel plate capacitor shown below is accumulating charge at a rate of 0.01 coulombs per second. What is the magnetic field a dis at a distance of 10 centimeters from the capacitor? So here, the way we should, the way I would recommend that you start out the problem. So you have charge on the capacitor as a function of, let's see, accumulating charge as a function of time, the QDT is 0.01 coulombs per second. What is the induced magnetic field? Um, 10 centimeters from the capacitor. Uh, 
coulombs per second. A dQ dT is also a current. So if the capacitor is accumulating charge at that rate, um, that tells us the current through the wire. And one of our, um, so one of the problems that we had done before, we had calculated that the magnetic field about a wire um, is mu naught times the current divided by 2 pi times the distance from the wire. This is one of the problems that you can solve with Ampere's law. So the way that you would approach this is that you, um, you are given the current. This is a physical constant. And you are given the distance from the wire. Now, there's a few different ways. You could use Ampere's law again, as we learned how to use it a couple chapters ago, and rederive the magnetic field. Or you could simply use the answer that we derived a couple chapters ago. OK, so this one says a 2.5 meter diameter. I'm going to go ahead and write this down. So if the diameter is 2.5 meters, the radius is 1.25 meters. Um, commu University communication satellite dish receives CV signals that have a maximum electric field strength of E naught equals 7.5. This is not refocusing on that. Let me see. There we go of 7.5 uh, microvolts per meter, so 10 to the negative 6 volts per meter. Um, what is the intensity of this wave? So here we can use some of the results from the book, the intensity uh, we will start with, um, so B, e, or sorry, I, the intensity is equal to C, B naught squared over 2 U naught. And we will also use C squared equals 1 over, or may, we may want to use 1 over, let me switch markers because this one's tired, epsilon naught mu naught, and then B naught equals E naught over C. equals, I think I'll just leave it, I won't convert epsilons and mu naughts, so this is epsilon naught squared over 2 mu naught, I get a c squared here, and I, uh, that cance one cancels out, so I have epsilon naught 2 mu naught c. Um, I am asked for the intensity, so I plug this number in and my physical constants, I get the intensity. Um, this intensity is equal to the power times, let's see, let's see, what is the power received by the antenna? The intensity is the power per unit area. Um, and then here, in this case, my area is pi times the radius of the disk squared. Now, it says, if so that tells me that the power is equal to epsilon or E naught squared times 2 mu naught c times pi times the radius of the dish squared. 
So th this is my answer to the first one. I just got to plug the numbers in. This is my answer to the second one. I just have to plug the numbers in. And then if this is, um, this asks, if the orbiting satellite broadcasts uniformly over an area of that many meters, how much power does it radiate? So this is giving power per unit area. And now I actually, I will take this intensity times the area of the United States. So that power is, or their approximated area of the United States. So that is my answer to the third one, where this is now the area of the United States. All right, and that concludes this chapter. Thank you for going through all about Maxwell's equations and electromagnetic radiation with me.